SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. It's uh, wonder to be, see, wonderful to see so many fa friendly faces in the crowd and a lot of interest here. Uh, it is uh, an honor and a privilege to be here before the uh, Lethbridge Senior Citizens Organization and the Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I, I look forward to our conversation afterwards. I hope to be able to share a little bit with you on the work that we're doing on our electricity grid. And I, I look forward to actually hearing what some of your thoughts and concerns are once I've been able to share a little bit with you. Seniors and their perspective is a large portion of not just Lethbridge, uh, Lethbridge's population, but also our province's population. So we gotta make sure that we get this so everybody can hear me at the back. And uh, this is the first time I've been through this particular slide presentation, so I hope I can get everything coordinated well and uh, not blow up the technology while I'm at it. We'll see if we can. All right, so this is basically the agenda of what we're going to go through here. When the Premier appointed me the Minister of Affordabilities and Utilities, she tasked me with several initiatives. These primarily involve making life more affordable for all Albertans as well as the necessary work for our government to ensure that Alberta's electricity grid is affordable, reliable, and sustainable for generations to come. Today, I'll try to give you an overview of the state of our electricity market and outline how we got to where we are today and what our, cost, our government has been doing and what we continue to do going forward to provide some corrections and some fixes to our electricity grid and lower those utility costs. And finally, we'll see where we're hoping to get to in the future. So I'm supposed to say here, before we're moving any further, I want to give you a brief overview of the agencies and their roles that are within our utility sector. So first we have the Alberta Electric Systems Operator, or the ISO, and it is an independent, not-for-profit organization that manages and operates our electrical grid. They do the day-to-day -day operations of making sure our supply and our demand are balanced at every moment of every day. And they're the ones who work with industry and government to make sure that we have that reliable power at our fingertips. Then we have the Alberta Utilities Commission that is an independent, quasi-judicial agency uh, for the province, and their job is to review and approve or not all the generation and power line projects and make sure that our utilities are delivered in a way that is fair and equitable and in the public's best interest. Then we have the Utilities Consumer Advocate that is here to help you, and they work on behalf of the consumer. They are funded by industry, and their job is to make sure that if you have any questions that you understand your utilities bill and help you navigate any potential disputes you might have with your energy provider. And they are here for you. We have increased their funding in this year's budget so that they have a, a, a greater capacity to help you through those as there are many questions coming up and we have many new people moving to Alberta that need that help. We have the Market Sur Surveillance Administrator, and they are responsible for enforcing a fair, open, and competitive market. They make sure that the providers of electricity and natural gas comply with all applicable legislation, standards, and regulations. We have the Balancing Pool, and it was established in 1999 to help manage the transition to a competition in Alberta's electricity industry. If you've ever looked closely at your power bill, you will have seen a balancing pool rate rider charge each month. The balancing pool was established when Alberta was transitioning to an open deregulated market and has continued to exist to help manage certain assets, revenues and expenses in order to keep our market functioning, although it is currently being winded down and we expect their job to be completed within the next year or two. And then of course we have the Alberta government. Our job is to work with all of these agencies and make government ministries, and, pardon me, and with other government ministries to oversee a reliable and affordable electricity grid within the province of Alberta. We set clear policies for industry, like the recent guidance that we put forward on the Agricultural First Initiative, uh, considering future renewable development, and our aim is to ensure that a system for you that is uh, affordable, 
reliable, and lasts into the future. How we got here. Alberta is unique in Canada that we are the only province in the entire country that has an energy-only market. Simply put, the energy-only market is a, a producer, pardon me, in an energy-only market, a producer of electricity is, not only pay, is only paid when they produce and sell electricity to the consumers. As a consumer, you pay for the electricity you use, and that's how it gets to your home. This structure has a good track record for providing Albertans with a reliable supply of electricity, and for the past 25 years has controlled those costs for consumers, and most of that 25 years we have had amongst the lowest costs for electricity in all of Canada. While we continue to move forward with an, electri an energy-only market, the way we produce and consume electri electricity has changed significantly over the last few years. We have seen a transition away from coal power generation to the addition of a significant amount of renewable energy. Today we are almost completely transitioned off coal and expect to be fully phased out before the end of this year, six years ahead of schedule. About half of our energy comes from cogeneration, where large industrial facility, facilities like in our oil sands that require a lot of heat or steam for their activities, they also produce electricity and contribute that to the grid. Another big chunk of our uh, electricity generation comes from natural gas generators and then renewables, uh, which are wind and solar. Roughly 6,000 megawatts of each are part of our grid. That's just a very rough uh, approximation. Our system was designed uh, for, to be reliant on coal generation, which meant it had a very few number of locations and a very stable transmission system and background. Under the former government, we moved off of coal to renewables, and this phase-out had a lot of consequences, that some of which were unforeseen. It has led to a system that has, in those renewable projects, which are uh, very abundant, and have hundreds of different sites, we have seen a tremendous increase in our transmission system to be able to accommodate them and bring them on to our, our system. You may be aware that the transmission cost on your bill can sometimes rival or even exceed the generation cost. That is due in part to the number of sites going from roughly 15 to now numbering close to 200 different sites. And while adding renewables to the energy mix is important to support our goal of carbon neutrality by 2050, its increasing popularity has impacted the sustainability and reliability of our electricity market. The increase in renewables has added some more pressure on the transmission system, which I was just sharing, and caused system reliability changes resulting in increased system costs borne by customers such as yourself. The world is evolving, and we need the electricity system that meets Alberta's needs to evolve as well, not just for today, but into the future. And we continue to work uh, to that end. So now to why we are here. What is our government doing to make life more affordable? Just last month, we took a huge step forward in modernizing our system by proclaiming Bill 22, or the Electricity Statutes Modernizing Alberta's Electricity Grid Amendment Act. I love how these acts are named. They're very complex and long-winded, but it is an act to allow for additional self-supply and storage within the grid. It encourage for, encourages further technology and further investment in new technologies to make sure that we can allow all of our consumers who would like to, to generate at the location of their residence or at the location of their business, and then either store or supply the excess to the grid. You may be wondering, how does this help me? And more importantly, how does this affect my power bill? Using energy storage instead of building more and more power lines will help to modernize the system and steer us in the direction of more affordable power. This leads into the next step, which we hope to uh, continue the conversation on throughout this year and into next year, of demand side, demand side management. Currently, our system is moving towards further electrification and increased electrical needs. And the old way of doing that was to just build more generation to meet those needs all the time. It's a very consumeristically driven system. We would like to go towards a conserving, a consumption system that allows you as a consumer 
to manage your load or manage your demand on the system by making good choices and rewarding you for those good choices. Let me see, did I go to? Maybe I did. By giving the businesses the ability to store excess energy to use when prices are high or sell back to the grid, this will help put downward pressure on our power prices. And the more excess power we have stored, the more power will be available when demand is high. Like during that cold snap on January the 13th, or heading into the summer months with the potential heat waves and the demand on air conditioners that is at new levels that we haven't experienced before. If we have more power stored, then we likely won't need to be issuing as many grid alerts. These changes will continue to meet the ever-evolving needs that you, as a consumer, have. And this act will also give me, as the Minister, the ability to establish a framework that will help continue to modernize our distribution system through proactive distribution planning, like demand-side management. And this will maximize the use of our existing grid. Rather than building more lines and wires, we want to use what we have to the fullest optimization that we can. And that is all in the effort to strive towards keeping your hard-earned dollars in your pockets by not spending them needlessly. However, this legislation is only one piece in the larger efforts to modernize our electricity grid. Distribution costs. One of the most common things I hear when talking to Albertans is, you should see my utility bill. And believe me, my office here in Lethbridge and my office in Edmonton, I have a stack of people's utility bills uh, with many things circled, and we continue to receive those. And we are working on all parts of that. Uh, and some, in, some of you in this room may have sent your utility bill to me. I have had a, a few people in Lethbridge that I've known to ask me if I would pay their utility bill for them. I'm sorry, that is not an announcement I'm willing to make today. <laughs> we know and we hear your frustrations about the high costs of electricity, transmission and distribution on your power bills. And that's why I'm here to share with you today what things we are looking at to help you manage those costs. I'd like to go in a little bit further detail on what is transmission and what is distribution and why does this have a cost that you have to see. Trans transmission and distribution are the, the different stages of carrying electricity over poles and wires from generators to you, the consumer. We, while we often think of them as lumped together as a single entity, transmission and distri distribution are two different components of the cost of power delivery. Let's, let's first look at distribution. Distribution costs vary f with the geographic location and the consumption levels uh, that you may have. Distribution charges will be higher for customers in rural Alberta than for customers in urban areas. This is because of low population density and long, long distances between the customer units. Most Alberta customers are served by four major companies. NMAX, predominantly in Calgary. Epcor, predominantly in Edmonton. Fortis, predominantly south rural, and ATCO, predominantly north rural. And the Alberta Utilities Commission regulates their distribution rates, but there are some exceptions to that. For example, the city of Lethbridge is one of the few municipalities in the province that have their own distribution rates approved by city council. Now let's look at transmission costs. While distribution can be looked at as a city road map, this transmission can be looked at as the highway that connects us across the province, moving energy at high speed from generators to distributors. Unlike distribution, transmission does not vary substantially based on where you live because it is the backbone of our system, a system across the entire province. Instead, transmission charges on your bill are based on how much electricity you use. And what can be done to lower these costs? And what we're looking at now is a better plan for our wire systems, paying closer attention uh, to considering the costs involved in developing and operating these systems, and we are continuing to work on these transmission policies. How the system was set up when we had 15, roughly 15 coal mines, the transmission system didn't change for, for many, many years. Many in this room may re re remember the huge bill that Albertans paid early 2000s on the, the large build of our transmission system. We don't want that to happen again. And uh, what has happened through that time frame is basically industry has been asked to provide solutions to our electricity grid. They go to the regulators to ask for approval. 
and the government has been hands off. I think that there needs to be more accountability within the system and I am hopeful to bring forward that accountability to you, the elector, by bringing industry, the regulators and government back to the table to work together for a better solution uh, for, uh, for all Albertans. And I'm committed to exploring further how these changes in transmission policy can continue to improve the affordability and reliability of our grid. I got ahead of myself. Uh, we know that we need to keep the cost of transmission infrastructure down, which in turn will help Albertans save money on their utility bills. And one way of doing this is by maximizing the use of our current infrastructure that we already have. And when we do need to build new infrastructure, we do it in the most cost-effective and efficient way possible. And again, good long-term planning will help us achieve those goals. The regulated rate option. There are two main charges that may be upon your energy bill. The cost of the energy consumed and the cost of delivering this energy. How much you pay for what you consume can vary depending on what rate option you have chosen. One of those options which many people in Alberta were on for many, many years was the regulated rate option or the RRO. What is this regulated rate option? In Alberta, the RRO is the default electric electricity option for consumers or those who don't want to sign a contract or who are unable to sign a contract with a retailer. One reason you might be unable to sign a contract is if you've moved to Alberta recently, you may not have a credit rating, and that would may be a deterrent from being able to sign a fixed contract. You would then be provided electricity as a need for life uh, through the RRO rate. I just said that. Instead of a fixed rate for a certain period, the RRO is a floating rate, like a variable rate mortgage that changes monthly depending on the market price for electricity. Our government is committed to maintain an affordable system, that look, and we are looking at how we can make the regulated rate option more suitable and more fully understood by consumers for what they are signed on to. We are examining numerous opportunities to mitigate price spikes and volatility, and most importantly, help Albertans save money. We are looking at multiple options to make sure any Albertan who is currently on the RO has access to different rate plans. That will provide increased predictability and stability for their bill, as well as allow for good competition between retailers providing you those different rates. As always, it is a top priority of our government to listen to the concerns of Albertans, and we continue to work on this file. I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to make uh, some announcement on the RO within the coming months. Interim measures. The last, the last few years, we have seen a period of continued high and vol volatile electricity prices. Every hour of every day, power generators must offer all of their generating capacity to Alberta's electricity demand. As previously mentioned, in our energy-only market, generators are only paid for the power that they generate and is consumed on, on the grid. To drive competition, the lowest price electricity is bought first. Sometimes generators will offer electricity at, very high, at a very high price with the intent to raise the overall electricity price and cover costs. This is a, a method of, this is what is called economic withholding. And the changes that we have, been, we have announced and that we'll be making at the beginning of July will support a more eff effective competition, include, in, improve that reliability, and protect cons consumers from some of this price volatility. To protect Albertans from prolonged spikes in electricity prices, we have implemented two temporary measures. And these are intended to limit the excessive price impacts of economic withholding, while ensuring that generators can still make a reasonable rate of return. Improved reliability, oh, wrong page. The measures pl place a reasonable limit on offer prices by controlling economic withholding and ensure that enough power generating units will be available and online to meet power demand within Alberta. I want to reiterate that while economic withholding was allowed in Alberta, the rules that were designed 25 years ago aren't the best fit for today's market or system. The interim solutions we've developed are pieces in a larger long-term effort to modernize our province's electricity grid and build a more effective system. 
The reason they're in term is they're in term for three years because at the end of that time, we are fully expecting to put forward a new market structure that will address it in a, in a permanent way. I would like to take one step back and share a little bit more about how we got here. When we moved away from coal and their very stable supply of low-cost electricity to the grid to renewable energy, Renewable energy has different characteristics. Obviously, the sun doesn't shine at night and it is not always windy, which means one of their characteristics is intermittency and volatility. Renewables also price into our electricity system typically at zero dollars per megawatt. So they would, when you bid into the, the grid, they are all stacked up in the, now, the amount of megawatts you generate and the price that you bid from lowest to highest. And then the ISO comes up with a strike price. That strike price is what everybody is paid, regardless of what you bid. If you bid less, you get paid the strike price. If you bid more, you get paid the strike price. But the order of purchase is from the lowest bid to the highest bid. And what we saw happening as we saw more and more renewables entering the marketplace and bidding in at that zero dollars, we saw more and more blocks of units at zero stack up on the lower cost of the spectrum. Then, when they were not able to submit their electricity to the grid, the thermal generators increased their price to bring up that strike price to make sure that even though they generated for less hours, they were still making the profit they needed. What we saw in the marketplace was an increase in volatility of that pricing from day to day, from moment to moment. So this isn't about fault, this is about characteristics of different types of generators, how they bid into the market. And that volatility uh, resulted in higher prices to uh, consumers because the retailers who were asked to predict what that price would be over three years were finding it increasingly difficult to find that price and to protect themselves. They kept increasing that till we saw that peak out last August at 31.8 cents a kilowatt hour. That is why we're working on uh, stability and reliability within our market so that we can reduce that volatility of, of pricing within our market structure. So we talked about economic withholding, uh, we talked about the changes and the interim solution. Long-term measures. Moving forward, our government is committed to creating an energy market that is both beneficial to industry and attracts investment, and meets the needs of Albertans for now and for years to come. As part of my mandate, I'm working with our agencies to, on solutions to protect consumers from spikes in electricity prices and lower the cost of utilities across the board. I have asked them to engage with industry stakeholders in designing a long-term market structure for the wholesale electricity market. And the Alberta Electric System Operator and the market surveillance administrator are working together on what they've called the restructured energy market. Alberta remains committed to a competitive market framework that provides choice and lowers the costs of serving our energy markets over the long term. While the planning and design of market reforms gets underway, the expected benefits for long-term reforms include lower costs, reduced market price volatility, and the improved affordability to all consumers. We also want to improve reliability. We have a very high expectation here in Alberta and across Canada that when you come home and turn on your light switch, the lights actually go on. And we have amongst the lowest number of days per year across all of Canada where that doesn't happen. Roughly in average terms in a year, Albertans would expect to have power outages of three or four days out of 365. Some of our Atlantic partners with their unique characteristics uh, Newfoundland is called the rock because it is, is a very rocky place. Most of their lines and wires are above ground. They can't bury them. And with their storms, uh, Newfoundlanders can often expect 30 to 40 days a year without power. Improved efficiency with stronger incentives for industry to invest in new energy sources that supply electricity when and where it is most valuable and needed by Albertans. And of course, improved certainty for investors for the ability to make reasonable but not excessive returns. In conclusion, I know I've gone through this, hopefully uh, in a way that is, uh, I am able to convey and, and is understandable to you. 
I hope I've covered enough information so that you have uh, an ability to ask questions and, and I'm happy to make sure we answer those. And while it's quite in depth, I want to give you a good snapshot of the many things our government is doing to modernize the power grid and also how we are working to reduce those costs to you. I want to reiterate that my vision for Alberta's electricity future is based on one simple goal, to ensure that Alberta's electricity system is available, reliable and affordable for for not just for today, but for generations to come. To wrap up, I'll say just how incredibly grateful I am to be in this role for, and for the opportunity to help ensure that Alberta continues to be the best and most affordable place to live, work, start a family, or have a business. And I thank you again for, you, for allowing me to be here today, and I look forward to answering your questions uh, to the best of my ability. Thank you very much. Next week, our speaker is going to be Sidney Shapiro, speaking about artificial intelligence. Now, we'd ask those of you who are waiting to ask questions to line up where Knut is here, along the wall. You have to state your name before you ask your question. We want no long stories or preludes or your scenario things, okay? We, we have lots of questions to go through, and please keep it concise. If you prefer to write out your question, you can give it to me, and I will read it. Only those that are legible and signed are going to be asked. And please keep your questions on point. Last week our speaker said, ask him about tourism. No, don't ask him about tourism. We're here about electricity, his portfolio, okay? <laughs> All right, so I think this is, uh, we're ready to go. First question, please. Oh, wait, can I just, I have one to read, I forgot. I'm going to read one first, Nathan, from Tom Moffat. Many state governments in the U.S. from places as diverse as Texas and Michigan have chosen renewable energy plus storage as the cheapest way to expand their electricity grids. Here in Alberta, we've restricted the building of renewable energy, and you've been saying the province should consider one of the most expensive methods of generating electricity, namely nuclear power. Can you recap your reasoning behind this choice of direction? And I'll give you the question if you need to refer to it. Great question. So I, I do want to reiterate that we still believe that renewables are part of the mix and we, we invite them to continue to come. We did want to make sure that we did that in a very responsible way and didn't um, restrict or sterilize agricultural land for, for generations with these, so we've asked for a responsible path forward that can allow for coexistence with the name to make sure that we still have an agricultural first uh, approach to that. Uh, Bill 22 does allow for more uh, renewable generation and it allows for storage. It increases the access for storage, so it, it would be following uh, Texas and Michigan in that example. Now, storage is still, uh, has some limitations of its own. Most lithium ion and battery storage of that nature has a four hour duration at the maximum, and it is still somewhat costly. So it is not the panacea, <clears throat> excuse me, it doesn't answer every question, although it is a part and has a part to play in that. The other uh, consideration as we look at jurisdictions around the world for electricity systems, uh, Australia and California are also of note. They have many of the same uh, challenges that we do. And they have both used storage quite a bit more. One of the, the very significant differences with three of those, those jurisdictions is their climate is significantly warmer than we have here in, in northern Alberta or Alberta in the north. And, and that does have a significant impact <clears throat> on batteries. And uh, so while it is a part of the mix, it doesn't solve every, uh, every option. And yes, we are looking at nuclear, but again, uh, I would ask you to consider that we're trying to change planning from year to year planning to decade to decade planning. Uh, in our conversations about nuclear, which is zero emitting and uh, very powerful in terms of what it returns per kilowatt or megawatt, uh, if we're planning out 20 years, which is my intent on nuclear, we do believe that those costs will be coming down around the globe, that technology is cutting edge, 
and we think that it could be a very viable, reliable, dispatchable green energy solution for Alberta. And at this point, we just want to make sure that we consider that as an option. What I don't want to see is continued reinvestment and reinvestment and reinvestment uh, while we try to get to a, a solution like that. As a comparison, uh, one of my concerns about carbon capture utilization and storage, which has been proposed for electricity, is that it is extremely, um, extremely expensive. One generating plant like Capital Power that is northwest of Edmonton can generate 900 megawatts. For it to be uh, completely CCUS compliant would cost over $2 billion. And there is currently zero return on investment for that technology. So rather than spending $2 billion that doesn't return anything, it does sequester carbon, uh, I would prefer to put that $2 billion to work at, at, uh, in nuclear where it can generate 1,000 megawatts of something. So these are considerations. We are trying to work with the, the best and brightest minds in the world. And we are watching very closely where Ontario is going, who has had nuclear energy uh, a program since 1959. And we are one of only six nations in the entire world that owns its own nuclear technology. Six. That's it. No one else in the world has that technology or has access to it. And uh, I think it's a consideration that we, we should consider. One, uh, one last fact, and then I'll move on to the next question, is that uh, both Alberta and uh, Saskatchewan have uh, huge resources of uranium, which is the fuel to, to use for nuclear. And again, using our own resources to develop energy, I think, is also beneficial for our country and our economy. Maureen Hawkins. My question is slightly morphed into two. <laughs> uh, the main one is, in spite of the greater cost for infrastructure, etc., I'm wondering if we shouldn't be focusing more and more on wind and solar, because they are the only forms that do not use water. We are facing now, from everything I've read, not only you know, the last three years of drought, but quite possibly decades of drought. We should be saving our water for our people, our plants, and our animals. This is true using water um, for nuclear as well, but we also have nowhere safe to store the, the waste yet. We keep talking about it, we're gonna dig under the Canadian shield, but you know, how many millennia from now? I'm worried that we should be focusing on water saving sources of energy, even if they start up being a little more expensive. Thank you, Maureen. Wonderful question. Appreciate that. So again, please hear me. We, we continue to have investment in, in renewables in 2023. 75% of all renewable projects in all of Canada happened here in Alberta. They right now uh, are just above 6,000 megawatts of our total generating capacity. And while they are very green and do, don't use water, they do have one or, or two um, unique characteristics that we can't manage. They don't, they don't uh, generate to demand. So we, we need a balance, you're right, we need a balanced approach. Um, in terms of all the rest, you're right, they use water. I had the opportunity to go to Bruce Nuclear Power Plant in Ontario, and the interesting thing is that they are almost net zero water usage. They take in a large volume of water, they, they generate it into heavy water, and then reuse that and reuse that. Over the course of a year, uh, it is a very small amount of net consumption which is one advantage compared to others. Uh, it, you, you're absolutely right. Water is a resource that we have to make sure that we manage. And one thing that maybe I should have explained a little bit more about in the conversation in my, my speaking notes was our intent for demand side management. Demand side management, it will be predominantly led by rooftop solar and potentially even uh, there's a lot of new technology for residential sized wind turbines. Uh, the, the models I've seen are about a meter round and they go on rooftops and they are also uh, potential generators. 
they work in a province like Alberta because we have the redundancy of natural gas. So if there's uh, no wind or no solar or, or whatever, uh, we have a bit of both and. And I think, I think that's what we're trying to get to is a, a both and approach um, that we utilize the best sources, maximize the best attributes, but also have a plan for what happens if. And, and that's what we're trying to do. But very, very good points, particularly in our water shortage that we have right now. We have to be very aware of that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shane Porter. Um, basically, just a couple of things. Um, just from your, from your point of view, you said we're the only outlier. Well, PEI also has a market-based system, not just us. Okay, and I want to know why the rest of the provinces don't have the same system, and they have a provincial agency that oversees them. And so when you take a look at the three, you call them independent, but I would question how independent they are. Why do you think that system is better, especially when some of them, the funding comes directly from those people that actually are involved in transmission? And so you, you know that, I know that. So the question is, why do you believe that is a better system when everyone else, and it doesn't matter whether they produce, use coal or use any other form or have hydro, why do we think we're better than them? Good question. Thank you for that. It was a decision made 25 years ago that, uh, and I think one that I've heard as I've done all my consultations, Albert is very proud to have an open and competitive market. Um, what we've seen in those other jurisdictions is that they are uh, state run, state controlled. And again, for the bulk of that 25 years, Alberta enjoyed the, some of the lowest electricity prices of any province for a long period of time. It's only recently that we have not seen that. Um, so when I've consulted largely with industry and, and talked with them, there is a very strong desire to keep uh, the energy only market and make sure that we have that. The, the alternative, most of those state run markets are uh, a capacity market where you pay for energy whether you use it or not. And, and that, uh, that can often lead to very expensive insurance for having that electricity, whether you, you use it or not, you're, you're spending a lot of money on that. The other thing is, it, in all of those jurisdictions, BC, Manitoba, Quebec, uh, and Ontario, they do not develop renewables at anywhere near the rate that we do. They don't. They, they, they have benefits of other things. BC, Manitoba, and Quebec in particular have hydro assets that we do not have. We have uh, the option for some hydro storage, which we are very keen to pr pursue because they are uh, non-emitting and they, they generate a very good uh, inertia type of electricity. And I believe that with the structures and, and the work that we are doing, if we can return to the lowest, lowest price of electricity transmission and distribution to Albertans, as well as have that reliability, then I think the energy only market can continue to serve them. If that doesn't uh, manage to do that, then I think we need to have a conversation about going to a capacity or a state run market. But at this point, uh, all the conversations I've had largely broadly, including with Canria, which is the Canadian Renewable Energy Association, they would like us to keep the energy only market as we have here in Alberta. Hi, my name is Deb Rakus. Thanks for the presentation. Um, in lots of jurisdictions, people residentially, I'm thinking, uh, have the ability to choose when they use their energy, which helps control their bills. So here in Alberta, basically everybody pays their consumption for the month. I'm wondering in your conversations of affordability, whether or not the industry as a whole is looking at time of use meters. Thank you. Excellent question and the simple answer is yes, absolutely. It, it is one of the things that we want to plan for. We, we, have, we have some use of smart meters within the province. I think we're somewhere about 45% of our meters are now smart meters. And in the structure of how we have things, uh, many of our distributors have brought forward ideas to increase the use of smart technology, increase the optimization. 
Uh, the regulators under the policy that exists currently, which is lowest cost to the consumer, they have declined many of those initiatives. So in the restructure of planning, bringing government to that table for accountability and transparency, and the consideration that electricity, in my opinion, is critical infrastructure. We literally cannot live without it, like we could in, in decades past. And therefore, I think the government needs to play a role on behalf of the taxpayer to support the ratepayer so that some of these good initiatives, good technology and smart technologies to allow things like time of use uh, billing to take place can fill the gap between the lowest cost to the consumer and the best long-term outcome for the consumer. And, and that's, that's where I do hope to go. It is definitely part of our conversation it is what we'd like to see happen so that uh, people who make good energy consumption choices are rewarded for that financially uh, for those choices. So that is part of our demand side management ongoing conversation. Those are the challenges, but again, I believe that governments should be accountable for the electricity system. They have tried in, in the last 25 years, many governments have stepped away to say, it's not our job, it's between the regulator and the, the industry. And I think that has let Albertans down. And I think that uh, there should be a requirement for government to be at that table, be accountable for those decisions, and be transparent with investments that may or may not take place uh, to help for the outcome of the, the system. Welcome. Al Olson, uh, thank you for your information that you've given us so far. It's, it uh, has been informative, and unfortunately, a lot of the thunder of the questions I had have been taken from me. But I did take exception to the one of the things that you did say about uh, being the cheapest electricity, being recent transplant from BC. Uh, we we were very surprised at the cost of our electricity, having a smaller home. Uh, not having any two of us living at home now, uh, it was quite a bit higher. Um, the other thing that we were used to was the time of use, and we took advantage of that. And I was disappointed to see that that's not the case. I'm glad that you'll uh, t take a look at that, but, but thank you. Okay. So I think, um, again, there, there are trends. And we do look back to getting to be one of the lowest costs. The last few years, we have not been the lowest cost. Uh, there's, there's a number of factors that have played into that. I do believe that we will get there. Again, on the way here today, I saw a billboard for direct energy for here in, in Lethbridge, 7.7 .7 cents a kilowatt hour. That is historically a very low uh, cost of electricity, but that's, again, the only generation. Now we do need to tackle the transmission and distribution. Um, elements to bring, bring that down. And uh, the time of use is, is the fourth element of the system, which is retail, to make sure that they have all the tools and abilities possible for them to give you those, those kinds of um, opportunities as a, a ratepayer and a consumer. So we're work, hoping to work on all the parts of that to, to get back to that low cost of electricity uh, for all consumers. So my name is Mark Edel. I was happy to hear that you'll be promoting rooftop residential production. However, up till now, we are restricted on how much we can produce. It's like about 110% of our yearly consumption. In your Bill 22, are you addressing this? Will I be able to put more solar panels on my roof? Because right now I'm restricted. I can only produce, and I've got more roof to put up. Uh, yes, I do believe that Bill 22 does allow for somewhat more uh, a generation. The challenge actually uh, resides in, in how our distribution system is built. Having more and more residential consumers contributing back into the grid uh, adds to that volatility, right? Because your generation uh, capability can, can continue to go up and down in an unpredictable way. And when it's just a few houses or, or, or a few neighborhoods, it's minimal in its impact. The more we pursue that, the more of that volatility. So I, we don't have all the answer for that, but it is a current conversation topic with our distributors to say, how do we manage that under demand side management? Because one of the things we're trying to solve for is volatility. By increasing that, we're also increasing volatility. So we're at, at a bit of a 
diverging point, and we continue to want to make sure that we, we manage that well. Part of the answer is through good technology and adoption of storage, which is why Bill 22 includes storage for those capabilities. So you can generate more with the intent that you store it for use overnight or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, and that would help with that, that volatility. But that, that's an ongoing conversation and those are some of the technical challenges that we face there. But uh, we have heard a lot of interest. People do want to do that. It also factors into the conversations about uh, virtual power plants and microgrids, where in a, a subdivision, for example, one or two people may have solar panels and electric vehicles, but many of the others don't. How do we look at them as a, a collective and not just as an individual residence? But again, a lot of work needs to be done at the distribution side of planning and the technology, which is why you can see where the regulators to some degree have said no because that's not the lowest cost to consumer because that technology is while being very good and maybe in the best interests of Alberta is not immediately the lowest cost. So that's why we want to try to, to work through that. Hopefully that answers your question. Nathan, you didn't answer my question about the regulators and basically uh, are they independent or not? And uh, and so you, you, you need to address that because over last bit, even uh, AER and the rest of the regulators have been really um, lambasted, not just by um, environmental groups, but by a number of groups. And so you need to know where does that funding come from. So, but that isn't the question I have here. But I want to know about inner ties. And so we have very few here, and so instead of uh, being involved in the production of new uh, generation plants, which has been a push by the government, why aren't we taking a look at more interties with our, with our neighbours? Well, good news is we are. Uh, we have future announcements that are coming out on interties. It is uh, one of the reasons why I continue to go back to good planning, because I think it will serve all Albertans very, very well. Uh, it was one of the very first things that I did when I became minister was talk to the ISO, the Alberta Electric Systems Operator, about our intertie with Montana, the Mattel line. Uh, there had been an outstanding issue for nearly five years, and within six months, uh, I finally was able to get the, the regulator to make a decision on that. Uh, into your first part of the question, which I apologize I didn't answer the first time, the regulators are independent, uh, and when they make their decisions, we. We cannot, without repercussion, make any uh, changes to that. We do, however, set the policy for them. The Alberta Energy Regulator, the AER, is under the Ministry of, of Energy, and they're working on that. I, I think you're right. There's, there's been a lot of uh, criticism of them and how they, they do their work. Uh, I, we are looking at that currently to make sure that they adhere to the policy set for, before them. The, the regulators that are under my ministry, we are working with them quite a bit. They are completely independent uh, and, and make those judgments, although we provide the legislation, regulation and policy that they uh, need to adhere to and, and we continue to work on, on that going forward. But there... Yeah. yeah, yeah. We can talk later. Thank you for your presentation, Nathan. And I have a question uh, about where water management intersects with hydroelectric generation. Oh, my name is Cheryl Bradley. Sorry. Yes, where hydroelectric generation intersects with water management and what the role of government is versus private sector. And some of the um, situations where this occurs are, for example, Transalta's dams on the Upper Bow River. And I understand we're having to pay Transalta to release water to benefit the river downstream, um, uh, the Old Man Reservoir has hydroelectric generation within it, but for the last year or so, the, the reservoir's been too low 
to generate electricity. And then I think of irrigation districts who have been putting uh, hydroelectric generators in the weirs, in their canal systems, and are interested in seeing more water flowing down those systems because of the revenue it brings from that hydroelectric generation. So there's potential for conflicts, I think, with public interest in all of those situations. And I'm wondering how governments set up to sort of adjudicate those. Another, another great question. So again, uh, it is the regulators that, that would adjudicate how that water and resources is utilized. Uh, whether you're the SMRD or Transalta, you would have to have put forward a, a plan and proposal before both the AUC and the ISO. Uh, the AUC for approval on the project and its use and its impacts to environment and all of those kind of things, and to the ISO for your ability to connect to the grid and thereby sell the electricity to the grid and then the MSA would govern your market behavior in the best interest to Albertans on that. So the, I believe that's how that, that is done. Uh, again, uh, those regulators set those prices, they set those contracts, they set those um, requirements and they monitor uh, how that is done. I think you're right, water usage is much more. Through hydroelectric, the, it is my understanding at least that the water, quote unquote, the water usage is minimal because it flows through and carries on. I, I believe there might be some uh, due to heat and evaporation, but uh, it is, I believe, considered negligible in, in the volumes that they're talking. Um, and you're right, because we have an energy only system, if there's no water going through that, there's no electricity being generated, there's no payment being made for that. Uh, so that's how that market, I think. I think I got all the parts of your question. If I didn't, please come and see me after. I'd be happy to talk a little bit more. Not quite as tall as you. Hi, Nathan. My name is Henning Mundel. I'm supposed to talk into the mic, so I'll face this way. Sorry. Um, uh, two things. One thing, perhaps sort of a cautionary note. Uh, one of the local, you talked about the residential windmills and one of the uh, local providers of uh, uh, solar panels, they actually were considering residential windmills beforehand. They tried all kinds of different designs and while they found that some of the models, they can withstand our strong winds, what though mechanically the problem was are gusts. So we may have 100 kilometer an hour wind, but 150 kilometer gusts. Okay, so that was a big problem. So cautionary note. The other thing is in, in the interest of transparency, and it, it would be nice as a consumer to know how within our province, within this jurisdiction, what sources provide what level of electricity. I get a daily online uh, thing from uh, Germany. For example, yesterday, 55% of the electricity was generated by wind in Germany. Some, Sometimes it's coal up top, um, because as of 2022, they have no more nuclear. Uh, and so coal has gone back up many times. But it would be very interesting for us as consumers to educate ourselves more where our electricity is coming from. Great comments. So in terms of the, the residential wind, uh, we, we try and, and believe as a general rule, if I can use that language carefully, that we want to be technology agnostic and allow for that. Um, and while residential wind may not be able to handle the gusts today, we can't predict what might be available five years from now. So I don't want to inadvertently block that potential in the future uh, by, by not having considered it today. And, and that's why we will we'll go there. Uh, if you go to the ISO website, I believe they do have in real time, every day, every minute of every day, you can see where the generation comes from uh, within Alberta. So we do have that technology as well. Uh, my ministry is also working on an affordability dashboard, which shows you different 
different trends of different markets within Alberta and how that relates to affordability, whether it's inflation or, or taxation or, or all kinds of different measures. So uh, maybe we'll go back to our office, we'll find the specific websites and links and provide them to SACPA to distribute to their members. Hi, Nathan. Christy Thomas. Good to see you again. Uh, two quick questions. The first one is um, uh, you've been speaking a lot about the distribution fees and the affordability, and I'm just wondering why the government removed the caps on those. And then second, there was a grid alert last night. Uh, can you tell me why that happened and what uh, the government's doing to prevent that from happening in the future? Great question. So, um, sorry, the first question, dis caps. Right, thank you. So. You're right, last year, beginning of 2023, uh, we saw the prices going up for electricity. We set a cap of 13.5 cents a kilowatt hour and deferred those costs to later to, to smooth out those costs to, to consumers. Um, we saw a peak again in the summer after the program ended uh, last June. And we saw prices go up somewhat this fall. Actually, they, they, from the peak in August, they have been coming down every single month and predicted to continue to come down. So even if we had had that cap in place, it would not have, have done anything because the price of electricity was under that 13.5 cent kilowatt hour cap rate for, I believe, March, uh, for February, March, and, and now April. Uh, and what we chose to do instead of, of doing a, a large, expensive, um, cap and deferral system, which was, was very expensive to Albertans as taxpayers. We, we had to fund that somehow. With the prices coming down and predicted to come down and stay down for at least three years, we thought we would proceed to uh, structurally correcting the issues that was causing this volatility in the first place. When we first put that system in place in 2023, my question of what happens when in the summer of 2023, we start to see the prices go up from increased uses in the summer. And the answer was, well, typically that doesn't happen and we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Lo and behold, we, we saw some of those highest prices ever. And we would continue to be that. So we'd be continuing to chase the tail with programs or we can try to get ahead of it and, and fix the structural challenges within our market system to make sure that we have that continued stable, reliable price and, and better planning. So that was a choice that we had to make. And, and because the prices were coming down and predicted to stay down, we thought it was better for the long-term result for Albertans to fix the market structure. Oh, sorry, the grid alert, yes, sir. So the grid alert yesterday, interestingly enough, uh, it was predicted and we saw for much of the day yesterday uh, a lot of zero price electricity it was very, very low. And our ISO, the Alberta Electric System Operator, told our thermal generators to stand down and turn their units off because we were having a lot of generation from sun and wind all day. When we hit about five o'clock in the evening, even though it was predicted and known that obviously the sun was going down, the wind uh, buried from the forecast and stopped blowing. And we lost two and a half thousand megawatts of generation in a matter of minutes. Your best thermal generators cannot turn on that fast. So that's why they sent a grid alert. They, they utilized the intertize, increased the amount that they imported. They were able to resolve that grid alert in about, I think, an hour and a half, two hours, something like that. Ironically, the new market structure is to help address that, that challenge of having to predict it. Uh, one of the factors of a day ahead market, depending on uh, how, how fully we utilize that, uh, it puts a commitment to the generator to saying how much electricity are they going to provide the following day for the consistency of that day. That speaks to that reliability. It helps the ISO in their job of management, and it also helps mitigate the fact that weather can change. It can change very quickly. And, and that's part of the reason why we're having these conversations uh, so that we can better uh, manage these kinds of situations, which happen. Weather changes and sometimes changes very rapidly. Bev Mendel Atherstone. Ten years ago, in 1918, Warren Buffett of Berkshire Hathaway bought Alberta's transmission lines for $3.2 billion. 
This company is now Alberta Link, which owns most of our transmission lines and to whom we pay. So how do you plan to bring down the transmission costs when it's owned by Warren Buffett and that money goes to him? Great question. That is one of our biggest challenges, certainly, is that uh, private entities own our transmission. It is another reason why I want to bring industry and government to the table with the regulators for the decisions that we make on transmission. So it is not hidden in some private company's books. Uh, governments can't say that's between industry and the regulator, which has happened for 20 years. And, and that's why I, I have said uh, a number of times today and, and said publicly elsewhere that I believe that government should be accountable for those decisions and provide the transparency that all Albertans uh, deserve in those decisions being made so they know where the money's going. And, and that will be fully transparent where it isn't right now. We do need to uh, make sure that our system serves Albertans, and that should be Albertans' number one goal, or Albertans' government's number one goal, is that you are well served with the system that you have. I see some deficiencies in that, and I'm, I'm working uh, very publicly to make sure that we correct those, and that all Albertans know where we're going and how we're going to try to get there in the future so they know where their dollars are being spent uh, to keep life affordable for them. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. And uh, do you have a take-home message for us now that we are at one o'clock? Yes. <laughs> I do have a take-home message. Again, that, that billboard that I saw today from Direct Energy offering 7.7 .7 kilowatts uh, cents per kilowatt hour. Um, go home, look at your utility bill, call your, your provider, see what rate, what program you're on. If you haven't checked it recently, you might be on a very high priced rate and you might be able to get a better rate lower. If you have any problems, please reach out to the utilities consumer advocate. It is their job, paid for by industry, not taxpayers, to make sure that you have the resources that you need to make sure that you're getting the service and provision of electricity that you require and hopefully keep your life more affordable. Thank you again very much for having me.